Good evening and welcome to Freeport Sustainability Board's, Board's lecture. The lecture tonight is on climate science and the Arctic and the Gulf of Maine. Uh, thank you all who made time to come here tonight in person and also everyone who is participating via Zoom. Uh, we're happy that tonight, for the first time this year, we can serve snacks again. So I wanted to send a special shout out to Maine Beer, who's providing the beer and donating it and also to the Freeport Sustainability Board members who run around the supermarket and local markets and got some snacks for us. Uh, this evening format, we'll start with presentations by Dr. Susanna Hancock and Dr. Janet Duffy Anderson, and we will follow up with questions at the very end. So anyone who's here in person can come up to the podium and ask a question at the mic, or you can just stay there and we'll repeat it here into the mic. Anyone on Zoom, uh, rather than raise your hand, please type your question into the Q&A box and we will read them here and respond to you. Uh, our first presenter will be Dr. Janet Duffy Anderson. She is the Chief Scientific Officer for the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, GMRI, and she works to understand mechanisms of climate change and the effects on marine ecosystems. She has documented the influence of climate change in the Bering Sea, the Chukchi Sea, and the Beaufort Sea. Janet has over 20 years of at-sea research experience in Arctic and sub-Arctic systems. Janet will be followed by Susanna Hancock, uh, who is an Arctic climate researcher who addresses the socio-geopolitical impacts of the climate crisis in the polar regions. She has been invited as a speaker at international TED events, UN Climate Symposia, and other global fora where she has shared the days with world le leaders. A Freeport native, Susanna is leaving next week for a 600 kilometer unsupported Arctic climate research trek. So I'm glad we have her now. She'll be exhausted after that trek. Uh, Susanna and Janet, thank you so much for joining us. And we really appreciate you making the time to share with us your amazing experiences. Thank you so much. I was going to talk a little bit about Arctic, high Arctic in Maine sure. for myself growing up in, in Freeport. Uh, you know, as Howie mentioned earlier, the Bowdoin Museum. We've got the Perry McMillan Museum at Bowdoin going out uh, to summer picnics out on Eagle Island, learning about Admiral Perry and heading up to, to the Arctic. Uh, this is a picture that Admiral Perry took, so a main connection there of uh, reaching the North Pole and doing that standard American thing of plant the flag and claiming the territory. Uh, so this is a picture of the North Pole that or allegedly at the North Pole in 1909. This is the North Pole, sort of what it looks like now. So you can see that this territory is an area that's changing quite rapidly. If you're familiar with the idea of climate stripes, this is an idea that during the time that we've been measuring the temperature of the planet, each year giving, the, giving a bar of a color that reflects temperature warming in relation to 19, that 1971 to 2000 period in centigrade. So what we're seeing is that, that changing and that warming. So this is the overall global average and this is the Arctic Ocean average. So you can see that it's hard to see the darker reds over there and the scale isn't quite the same. This is starting calculations about 40 years after that previous image, but giving you an idea that this is a part of the world that's warming, uh, you know, four times on average faster than the rest of the planet. So quite extremes what we're seeing. My own experience with that, I started off uh, doing some Arctic research when I was in college and did some work on a glacier in Iceland. This is an image that was taken back when I was in elementary school of that, of a section of that glacier. And this is it two years ago. And again, another part of that same glacier back in the 90s, late 90s, and two years ago. So just to give you an idea of some of the changes that we're seeing. I'll talk a little bit about some of the projects that I'm gonna be involved in when I'm heading off in the Arctic. Most of the research that I do in general is sort of environmental or political anthropology. So looking at geopolitics of a warming planet, how that's bringing new people together, bringing new challenges, global cooperation, conflict, uh, questions over access to resources. 
all sorts of things. Uh, and I've spent the past two years working with a decade of ocean science, which is part of the UN Intergovernmental inter inter Oceanographic Commission and with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, especially looking at an offshoot project that they have looking specifically at the Arctic on sort of the ocean land interface. But uh, because we have Janet who's talking a lot about ocean stuff, I wanna stay away from that because a lot of the ocean, I don't necessarily, I'm, I pretend to know what I'm talking about, but most of what I do is more the land side, but it's heavily influenced by the ocean. So overlaps a little bit, but I'm gonna talk about a few specific projects that I'll be look, working on when I'm, in the, uh, when I'm in the Arctic. This image here is the red, Right here is, I'll be basically just north of here. This is Svalbard, which is about 550 nautical miles from the North Pole, right here. So I'll be tre trekking across Svalbard and a bit, a bit north of it. So that's just to give you some geographical location. So we're working on several projects. One is a project that if anybody's interested in citizen science, so going out and doing some yourself, uh, there's a offshoot of this project that you can get involved in if you're interested in clouds and wanna take some observations yourself. But clouds are a major system of regulation of the earth temperature. So they absorb light, they reflect light, they scatter light, energy, et cetera, coming from the sun. Different types of clouds, as you may be familiar with rain clouds, thunder clouds, clouds that come with sunny weather, they, they have different densities, they have different compositions, and therefore they have different impacts on, on our environment. And what we're finding is that the actual composition of clouds is changing as the chemicals in our atmosphere are changing. So we can, and therefore they impact the Earth's climate in different ways. So in conjunction with satellites, we'll be taking some measurements on the ground that can help determine what these compositions are, how they're changing, and how that affects the environment. So basically, here I am, so I'm probably the one yelling because I'm probably sometimes loud. Um, you know, Africa, not, you know, if we rotate 90 degrees, we're not in Africa, but back up in the Arctic. Uh, you know, I have a satellite that takes images from above, and obviously those images are blocked with, you know, cloud, clouds can't see, you can't necessarily look through the ground to see clouds, uh, the layers of clouds, a lot of things that satellites can see and can't see. And then you can take measurements from the ground up and you time them to do them together and you can do them in coordination and you can get a very sort of a three-dimensional picture of what's going on. So that is one, one project. Another is also working with satellites to look at greenery. And greenery around here is cool because it means gardening and springtime. But in the Arctic, it's a bit of a different picture. So in one of the concerns and why the Arctic is, well, one of the reasons it's melting, warming so rapidly is we have what's called feedback loops. And this is, you know, you can trigger a system and it sort of can become self-propelling. So for example, with the ice melt, the sun, in very crude terms, the sun reflects off the ice and a lot, and the, the ice reflects a lot of the sun, whereas a dark ocean absorbs a lot of the sun, the energy. And so as you know, the ocean absorbs more energy, the temperature heats up, that causes more ice melt, et cetera, and the cycles go on. Another one of these is on looking at vegetation. And so vegetation is darker, absorbs more energy, as well. So what we're seeing is in quite a lot of, quite, quite a number of parts, and, you, and sort of you're looking for more of the greens in this image, is where we're actually getting increased vegetation. And several ways of measuring this, but again, you know, looking at satellite data, one of them is that me measuring the difference between visible and infrared light. So, uh, This started in the 1970s, really, with satellites noticing that there was an increased greening, and there's about three to four percent of the Arctic looking at some of those red regions that is actually sort of browning, not getting more vegetative. 
But what we're looking at is the absorb, you look at the difference between the absorption of visible light and the reflection of infrared light. And that can tell you a lot about the density of the greenery. So whether it's increasing shrubbery or whether it's growing as the permafrost is melting, which again is putting out other sort of triggering other feedback loops through the permafrost that's holding a lot of the carbon and methane that again gets released into the atmosphere. So this, this can let us know a lot about, you know, what's some of the things that are, that's going on and, you know, putting some of those measurements sort of into practice. So then another little project, I bet everybody can guess what this is. Any ideas? Microplastics, yeah, plastics, microplastics. So this image isn't from the Arctic, but you can find a very similar one from the Arctic. So microplastics, these are found in all parts of the world. And there was a paper published a little while ago that a friend of mine worked on that was like, you know, finding microplastics in inside krill in, you know, underneath the Antarctic ice sheet. I mean, these things are ubiquitous and everywhere. And what's scary and interesting about them in parts of the Arctic is that there aren't people there. So they are traveling there through ocean currents, through the atmosphere, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, so this is a image that is looking at sort of current areas of study of microplastics. So finding them in fishes, in mammals and seabirds. So sometimes they, they can actually, you know, kill the animal. So, you know, coming across 90, about 90% of, I think it's fulmar birds that are sort of a gull-like species that are dying in the ocean, in the Arctic when they're found are, ha, have been shown to have died because of plastic ingestion. And this can either be, you know, suffocation or it can pierce some kind of internal part, but usually it's also starvation because the plastics get in their stomach and they don't realize they're hungry and they don't eat. So we won't we won't, well, necessarily, we won't at all be hurting any animals in the process of this, but you know, looking at any kind of stomach contents of any creature that we find, because uh, we're finding plastics in any, everything from polar bears to seals to fish. And it's not necessarily just in their stomach, it's actually you know, in the flesh. And there was, I don't know, there's a recently hearing about in the past two years or so about plastics making it in, into human blood and placentas and lung tissue where we hadn't previously known about plastic. So a lot of this, you know, is responsible, and this is, you know, getting into Janet's territory. A lot of the responsibility for this is the, are the ocean currents. And so if any, if everybody here probably remembers the 1989 oil spill of Exxon Valdez in Alaska, you know, that extended 1,300 miles or so along the coast. And that was, you know, a lot of that due to wind and ocean currents that, you know, these systems are taking things everywhere. And so the concern with the plastics, apart from the fact that they're everywhere, is that they get into food chains and they get into, into our ecosystems and kind of embedded in systems. You know, if we, the average person a week eats about the equivalent of one credit card of plastic. So if you haven't eaten your credit card this week, you know, most of that we consume through water, but also seafood, uh, even honey, and various things that now have, have plastics in them. I think that amounts to about 44 pounds on average for a person over the lifetime, if you want the statistic. Uh, and so with this, you know, what we're seeing is it, you know, it getting into the food chains and it getting into, instead of getting into our ecosystems. So whether that's inadvertent consumption, for example, a fish that doesn't necessarily, you know, might actually, well, may actively consume plastic thinking it's food or something else that then eats that fish or eats something that grew out of the ground that had been watered with tap water that came from something that had plastic contamination. So we're looking at, you know, where these plastics are and how they're, how they're getting around and what their, their impacts are. So I think I'll, yeah. And so just having, having the ocean currents that are carrying these all over. So this is just a very crude, map of some of the ocean currents in the Arctic. And you can really see that, again, the Svalbard area that I'll be is right up in here. And 
the the particles that we're finding there are from all continents of the world. It's not, you know, a lot of it is East Coast US and Europe, but finding things, you know, with little made made in various locations, uh, stamps and so that's really things are on a hike, traveling all over the place. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is just a little bit about what goes on doing research in the high Arctic. So specific things that we deal with that make on land research there, and Janet's going to talk a little bit about water research. So things that get concerning on land or things we have to worry about. Obviously, ice is great when it's solid and less great when it's not solid. So, you know, ice, ice leads, so cracks in ice. If you, you know, if you go down to the ocean and the shore in the winter when it's frozen and you can see how the tide comes in and out and the ice breaks apart. So you get a lot of that and you can't necessarily ski or walk across that. So you can have open parts of water, you can have parts that are, or parts of the ice that are very thin. Ice also is very mobile, it moves it can move up to about 20 kilometers in a night. So you can camp somewhere and wake up somewhere, not where you thought you were gonna be, <laughs> you know, a couple days ago from where you were. So extend journeys a little bit, but uh, the sleds. So here's, a, here's an example of a sled that I'm pulling here. This one is probably weighs about 40 or 50 kilos, but uh, the one I'll be using can weigh upwards of about 80 kilos and they go wherever they wanna go. So especially when you're going downhill, you've got a little bit of a torpedo strap behind you that outweighs me by a good chunk. So got to sort of carry everything with us. So then uh, the cold. So we'll be sleeping in tents and you can't really tell here, but the tent is open and that's because we can't have any condensation build up in the tent. So we've got vents in the tent and try to keep it as open as possible which means that it's even less warm than it could be, but that's because condensation pre is frozen and there's no way of drying anything. So anything that gets wet will stay wet. And down particularly is very warm, but it's only warm when it's dry. And after a while of being wet, it starts to lose any insulative properties that it has. So everything has to stay very dry. Uh, it also means, you know, if you're sleeping, you're sleeping inside a liner in your sleeping bag that is basically effectively a plastic bag trapping any kind of sweat, any kind of moisture, condensation from getting into the bag. And you've got to have to make sure that, you know, when you get out of the bag, you dry off, you know, you use your body heat to dry off as best you can before you change, get ready for the day. And lots of layer changing when you're underway, skiing, it's, Fairly good exercise, but you can't build up a sweat because it won't dry. So it's a thing. Uh, here you can see the person that I was sharing this tent with is building a wind a wind wall. So basically, build structures that can be up to about two meters deep, and that keeps the wind from blowing uh, snow on the tent. And also for that reason, you know, sleep with your feet close to the tent so that if snow does blow onto the tent, it hits your feet rather than your head. And we can sleep in, those tents are rated to about 73 degrees, so, uh, 73 miles per hour, so just about a category one hurricane. Anything above a category one, you have to bury yourself in the snow. So here I'm starting to dig. And again, on the everything can't get wet, just coat it up in Gore-Tex and have Gore-Tex gloves that go over everything that I've taken off here because getting, you know, running around doing exercise in Gore-Tex is a great way to build up a sweat. So this is just inside, kind of hard to see here, but inside one of the tent, uh, one of the snow caves. And so this is just from my perspective, sleeping in it. So you can see that we've blocked off the entrance to the tent with one of the sleds, one of the pulks, and have a shovel inside so that you can help shovel yourself out in the morning if you need to but just, you know, made some raised sleeping platforms and then, a, you know, a hollow walkway, lower walkway that the cold can sink a little bit. So it gets, it gets another degree or two warm, which is a little bit nice. So I think I will leave it there. And then this is 
a photo I took. It's not a very good photo, but I took it with my phone and I kind of liked it because that was the camera that I had with me at the time. So I will leave it there and pass it back to Jenna. So um, thank you again for the kind invitation to come and speak with you all. And especially thank you to Susanna who reached out and invited me to participate in this uh, lecture with her. I'm uh, really excited to be here. I thought I would just present a little bit of my background. Um, I grew up in New York. I got most of my training in the Middle Atlantic in Pennsylvania, University of Delaware, uh, Rutgers in New Jersey. And then shortly after um, my graduate degree, I moved out to the West Coast and got a job at the University of Washington and eventually started working at the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, Alaska Fishery Science Center, which is located in Seattle, Washington, and provides stewardship for the U.S. Arctic, which is on the Pacific side in Alaska. And so all of my uh, Arctic training has been in uh, U.S. waters, in Gulf of Alaska, Bering Sea, Chukchi Sea, and Beaufort Sea. Um, and recently, I moved back to the East Coast because I have the great privilege of serving as the Chief Scientific Officer for the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and uh, I began my tenure there in March. So uh, just a little bit to orient um, to the ecosystems that we're going to be talking about this evening, I want to share with you, kind of first present some of the work done uh, in the U.S. Arctic. So we'll be talking about Alaskan waters, and then we'll segue to um, Gulf of Maine and what we can learn from uh, experiences in Alaska with respect to Arctic warming and effects in Gulf of Maine. So I'm going to be talking about this area, the Chukchi Sea, which is here, and the Beaufort Sea here. And to kind of orient you to Susanna's slides, the North Pole would be up, off, just off the screen. <laughs> And then in the second half, we'll kind of bring it around to Gulf of Maine and why some of the changes that are happening in the Arctic, Atlantic Arctic and Pacific Arctic, um, matter to places that are subarctic like Gulf of Maine. Okay, so in the Arctic, we can ask the question, um, how is an ecosystem defined once sea ice is gone? This is the critical piece of um, marine Arctic, the, the critical marine Arctic question. As temperature warms, we're going to lose sea ice, and what does that mean for marine ecosystems um, uh, in the Arctic and uh, in the Antarctic as well? So to kind of show you a little bit about what this looks like, we're talking about loss of sea ice, so we're talking about increasing open water. This um, panel, this is a basically a oops, satellite image from, no, from NASA of sea ice on April 1st in 2012 and the same image in 2019, so just seven years later. This fluffy stuff is clouds and this hardscape stuff is ice. This is Alaska here, this is the Bering Strait, this is Russia, and after a significant marine heat wave, what we see is that we have now a lot more open water. This is Alaska, again Bering Strait, and Russia, and all of this is open water. This is all clouds now, and all open water up until all the way into the Beaufort Sea. So you can really, it's very striking how much sea ice has been lost. How do we kind of measure this? Well, satellite imagery is one, one way, but we also have a host of instrumentation that's out in the water column at all times, measuring heat flux, sea ice, and changes in the ecosystem. And each one of these dots is an observation in any particular year. So you can see we have lots of observations. We have observations from ships, observations from moored arrays, so things that are actually in the water column all the time. Um, things that we put in and pull back out, and also uncrewed uh, devices as well. So to give you a kind of an example of what these look like, this is a moored array. It's anchored to the bottom. There's some sort of tether with lots of instrumentation on it. And then um, the moor mooring is at the top so that we can find it again. And that's 
an example here. You can see this is the mooring, this is the tether, and all along here is the instrumentation. That can be temperature, salinity, um, light meters, oxygen meters, phytoplankton collections, all sorts of things we, we put out in the, um, on the moorings. This is an example of an unmanned device. So these are put into the water column and they can be remote, remote controlled. This is quite large. Um, they can be drifting as this is. It gets thrown in and it sort of bobs along with the water and it has lots of sensors on it. It can take temperature as it moves around. This is one of our uh, main research vessels. This is the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Healy. The U.S. has two, um, two ice cutters in its fleet. It has one that services the Arctic mission, that's the Healy, and it has one that services the Antarctic mission, that's the Polar Star. And, um, and then we also have uh, zodiacs. I lost the cursor. We also have a number of zodiacs that we can go out and take measurements uh, from in drifting sea ice, or we can travel actually to an ice flow and get off on it and take measurements. So lots of different ways that we can measure the marine ecosystem. And these type of arrays are present not just in the Pacific Arctic, but in the Atlantic Arctic as well. Um, so let's just look at a little bit of data to see changes in ice concentration in the U.S. Arctic. So this uh, little thermometer means that heat is increasing. And increasing heat in the water column means decreasing sea surface ice concentration, more open water. And what we can see is that the open water, let's see, I really like to find the cursor on here. There we go. Open water is increasing. <laughs> so um, there is now more open water uh, by more than a month um, than even just 10 years ago. And in, in, since the 80s, this statistic here I think is quite striking. There were only 40 days of open water in the Arctic, and in uh, 19, in yeah, 2020, now we have more than 200 days of open water in the Arctic. So quite significant. And we can look at that with this plot. So let's see, for those here and online, this is uh, days of the year, and these are years, and you can see that ice cover at this particular location up here where this uh, circle is. This is the tr trend. Every year we're losing about four days of ice at that spot. So over the period of, what is it, since we started 1985 to 2015, you can see that the percent ice cover, that number of days of, that that is um, open water has changed from 40 days to 200 days over that time period at this particular location in the Beaufort Sea. And this is, these are our data. Heat changes uh, not just ice, but heat also changes currents in the Pacific Arctic. <clears throat> and what we can see here, this, this flow is particularly important, this red one. That is, that is a current that originates in the Gulf of Alaska, which is a subarctic system and has a significant heat content to it. As ice melts in the Arctic here, that current is, gets stronger. And so it's carrying more heat at a faster velocity into the Arctic and contributes to the melting of sea ice. And that's one of the feedback loops that Susanna mentioned. If when you lose a little bit of ice, you increase the heat flow. The heat flow brings more heat into the Arctic that melts more ice, and you get a kind of a, um, a loop So to show you a little bit about what this looks like, I have these two videos. One of the things ice does is it uh, dampens storms. So this is a video from one of our, one of our trips here. Um, and you can see that's a pretty significant storm outside. That storm intensity is elevated when sea ice is gone. Sea ice will dampen the effect of wind, dampen the effect of tran uh, 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 currents. Without it, what you get is an intensification of storms, and storms in the Arctic serve to 
mix the whole water column. So what you're getting is kind of a changing system without ice. And then this is, I just thought, kind of funny. This is an intern who worked with me putting on some of the gear that we use to go outside when we're in those kinds of storms um, to keep, keep safe and warm. Whoops. Next. Next. So heat changes currents. Heat changes sea ice concentration. Heat also changes food webs. <clears throat> and this works primarily at the base of the food web. The smallest organisms are the ones that are most immediately responsive to changes in heat. They have a very short lifespan. They reproduce quickly, they die quickly, and their metabolism speeds up under situations of heat. And so when we add heat to the Arctic food, food web, we are changing the base of the prey for that food web. In this case, uh, marine algae here and marine copepods here that really are the food source for everything else um, in the Arctic. So what does that look like when you're looking at the tiniest things? Here's a, a plankton, that's a plankton net that we put in the water column. We're just filtering very fine uh, organisms out of the water column, rinsing them off, and then kind of sieving them. I'll turn this off. You get the idea of what that looks like. And then sieving them um, through a sieve so that you can see. They, these are bioluminescing. And some examples of um, the critters that are in that sieve are kind of along the panel there on the right-hand side as you look at it. Copepods, amphipods, that's a very small octopus, and uh, larval fish. Okay, so let's switch it up and think about Gulf of Maine. So these are some changes that we're seeing in the Pacific Arctic changes with respect to loss of sea ice, changes in current flow, so increasing velocities of currents, um, changes at the base of the food web. Um, what, is, what does that mean for subarctic systems like Gulf of Maine? So Gulf of Maine is in a unique position in that it is temperate but it has a number of properties that make it very similar to the Arctic, which is why I was interested in coming and working in this particular system. So as, <clears throat> as ice in the Atlantic Arctic melts, it changes uh, a flow field that's key to the Gulf of Maine ecosystem, and that's the Labrador current. So as ice melts, this current actually slows down. And as this blue current slows down, the other major current in the system, the Gulf Stream, which is running from Florida here northward, ramps up. The Labrador Current is cold water coming down from the Arctic, and the Gulf Stream is warm water coming up uh, equator from the e equator flowing northward. <coughs> As the ice melts and is slowing down the Labrador current, the Gulf Stream, the, the warm stream, is intensifying. And so we can see that here, in this one. This yellow is the former footprint of where the Gulf Stream used to be. The Gulf Stream always like, kind of turned offshore in our area and would go up kind of toward uh, UK, for example. But as the Labrador current has slowed down, <clears throat> the Gulf Stream's gotten wider. Gotten wider over time. And it's coming up closer to shore than it used to be. And it's warming more of the near shore water. So what we're getting is kind of a turning off of the tap of the water that's coming from the Arctic, and a turning on of the tap that's coming up from the equator. So what does that look like if we look at temperatures in Gulf of Maine? It's 
kind of an interesting, really compelling pattern. So this zero is the normalized sea surface temperature for Gulf of Maine. And then anything in the red is deviation warmer than the average. And everything blue is a deviation colder than the average. Zero is just the average. Zero is not the actual temperature. It's just the mean temperature over this time. And what you can see is that historically, Gulf of Maine had kind of an oscillation. It would be warm and then cold, and warm and then cold, and warm and cold, until about 2008, 2009, when it started being warmer than average, and never went back to being colder than average. It just gets warmer and warmer and warmer than average. And in fact, 2021 was the warmest year on record in Gulf of Maine in the, in the climatological record. So what we see is that this ecosystem has not only warmed, but lost its, like, lost its oscillation as well. What does that mean for the food web? We can see that the currents have changed. We can see that heating has increased. Is it having the same effect in Gulf of Maine, which is not an Arctic ecosystem? but has a lot of similarities to the Arctic. Is it affecting the food web? Yes. So this is uh, zooplankton diversity on this axis. The number of different species of zooplankton on that axis and the time here. And what you can see is the number of species of zooplankton is increasing in this area. Why are the number of species increasing? Because we're seeing a proliferation of species zooplankton that are coming up from the mid-Atlantic. More types of zooplankton that are not cold water zooplankton. They're warm water, warm affinity zooplankton. Cold water zooplankton are special because they have a big lipid, it's a big fat globule in there. They're really fatty. So they're great at the base of the food chain. Warm water copepods are about a third of that fat content. So they're really nutrient poor. And we're seeing a proliferation of them at the base of the food web. We are seeing changes in fish communities. This is commercial landing. So these are big ticket fish like halibut and cod. <clears throat> the gray bar is that stanza of prolonged heat here. And what you can see is that commercial landings of commercial fish is declining over time in Georgia's Bank and in Gulf of Maine. But the number of species of fish is increasing. And these are not commercial species. These are mid-Atlantic species that are moving into the region. We're seeing more types of fish fewer of our commercial species, but more diversity. And that diversity is becoming because fish are coming from elsewhere. And so what you can see is that, again, this is the heat stanza that we're talking about. This is a uh, number of species in, uh, I think this is George's Bank, and this is Gulf of Maine. Increasing, and we're getting warm affinity species like summer flounder, this one here, and sea bass. Heat also changes our communities. So we're seeing warming oceans. Okay. Distributional shifts in uh, where, our, where our fish go that are in the water column, they're following cold water, they're moving out of our system and into, they're following basically the cold water as chasing north, trying to find it. <clears throat> so in our region, for Atlantic cod, it means that uh, the Atlantic cod are moving up uh, out of US national waters and into Canada. And in Alaska, it means they're moving out of Alaskan waters and into Russia. We are facing uh, loss of sea ice and sea level rise, changing food webs, which I mentioned, harmful algal blooms. This is not something that typically we see in cold water systems. We are seeing them increase. Harmful algal blooms tend to be a warm water phenomenon. 
And because we're seeing changing currents in warming water, we are seeing more prevalence of harmful algal blooms uh, in the summertime. And finally, uh, habitat shifts. And these are important because if we're going to be using our marine resources, fishing, it means that our fleets have to go farther from shore in order to catch the same number of fish that they would have caught 15 or 20 years ago uh, in their own backyard. So what can we do? Um, I would argue that we can do a lot. Um, and we don't actually have to do very much. And it's, it's actually, hear me out on this, it's actually I take a little bit of um, solace in the fact that this is a, a, a man-driven phenomenon. Because climate change is something that people have done. And it means that people can undo it. It is a problem of our own making, and we know how to fix it. If this was some random event, if the climate was warming because, you know, I don't know, like the Earth was changing its rotation, or it was being pulled into the sun, I mean, imagine all the different phenomena it could be. We wouldn't know what to do. But we, climate change is a, is a problem that we have a handle on, and we can do some things to affect change with just small incremental changes in, in our lives. Use electricity wisely, for example. Conserve water. <laughs> Use public transit when possible so we can decrease our carbon footprint. Use less plastic, as Susanna mentioned. And something that's near and dear to my heart, we can eat sustainably harvested seafood. We don't have to eat as much meat that uh, is very energy intensive to, to grow. Um, so I think that's my last. Yeah, that's my last slide. Thank you. So if anybody has any questions, or if you're on Zoom and have any questions that you want to add to the question, the Q&A at the bottom, happy to field any of those. Bali. And you have to, you want to come up here, and otherwise we have to repeat. But you can come up here. And... Thank you so much. That was super interesting. So my question is about the geopolitical impact of the warming and melting of the sea ice up in the Arctic. Who's fighting for that? Uh, who's coming up ahead and who's likely to benefit most okay. from that happening? Thank you. We can both take a um, so, so the, the geopolitical, the geopolitical impacts of the warming ice. So, so uh, I, was, I was, I guess it was three years ago now, at a conference in China and I was looking at fisheries and I was supposed to be getting into sort of some of the black market uh, man, uh, manatee ray uh, gill trading where they harvest the manta ray gills and they trade them and they're trying to do it where they're not fishing sustainably and trying to get away, from it, get away with it and they were talking about you know how not only are they having to fish in certain areas where they're coming up with other governments that are fishing in other areas and who has the right to do what they wanted to do. But they're going to talk about how they're really excited because they're working with Russia to be able to increase their shipping through the Arctic. And Russia is, so I guess as ice is melting in the north, there's increased interest in shipping there. And so this is the first time I had heard anybody actually excited about the increased shipping and that aren't these, isn't this really cool with these new opportunities. But uh, so we've got the ice is melting, so shipping is one of those things that can go through. So for example, somebody in Shanghai who might ship something to Rotterdam, for example, a pretty common shipping route, can go through, go around India, Suez Canal, dealing with piracy, dealing with various weather patterns dealing with the Suez Canal, as we all know that that can get blocked and what happens with that, or then go across the Arctic. Um, the Arctic, if all goes well, can cut time in about half. So it takes a journey that might be a month down to two weeks. So that's me a saving of fuel, a saving of people time, it, or you can also say, well, you can do twice as much for the same amount of time. But the Arctic isn't an area that is open in full. So if you're going north of Russia, you're being accompanied by an icebreaker that's Russian. They are charging fees for the service. So Russia and China have been really working a lot together. And this is all changing 
quite a lot with the with the war in Ukraine, but Russia has been doing this sort of against the wishes of the Ar other states in the Arctic. And it's sort of getting into the who, who's aligning with what and how. So we have states like Singapore and Bangladesh, which the last time I checked are pretty close to the equator, uh, who are arguing that they have a stake in the Arctic and they should be involved in Arctic negotiations because they are seeing themselves as near Arctic states. Um, Singapore, last time I was there, was, you know, one degree north or so. So the idea that it's identifying itself as a near Arctic state, but it's because it has interest in potential shipping. It has interest in some of these things. Uh, looking at fish, for example, I mean, Britain has been fishing Icelandic waters since the 1400s, and Iceland has been complaining about overfishing since the 1400s. And they've been going back and forth. There's a series of so-called cod wars back in the mid 19, mid 20th century to the sort of 1950s to 1970s maybe. And that was about Iceland actually bringing, I'm sorry, Britain actually bringing in the British Navy to fight for fishing rights in Iceland when Iceland unilaterally closed or extended its sort of territorial, territorial water zones. Uh, so, you know, fishing areas, shipping uh, resources, there's questions about deep sea mining where countries are saying, if, you know, we can get the minerals that we need for renewable energy, we can get them from the ocean floor. And some states saying that this is a great idea and others saying that this is devastating to the environment for a plethora of re reasons. You know, you, you mess up the, the phytoplankton, changing the changing the food systems the food webs changing the ph of the water changing all sorts of things that can affect that have consequences and when you're looking at pollution in the water like it is in the air it's it goes across any kind of state boundaries so what you do somewhere can affect somewhere else so those are just some some examples uh, what you said you know and talking a little bit about what janet was talking about with you know, some of the, the food catches. And I think, I don't know, you can, you know a lot more about this, but some of those species that we're getting up here that are not our sort of harvest catch, but the sea bass, for example, aren't they regulated by the mid-Atlantic? Mm -hmm. Something so that, you know, we have fish here that are in our waters that we don't regulate because they're from elsewhere. And you're seeing this, you know, within one country is very different than when it's cross-border. And there are some of those that are in contested regions um, and it very, very much like, you know, as we know, you know, our lobsters are growing north to Canada. You're seeing this in some places around the world where t migrations like that have happened. And then the state where they were, the country where they were, still wants the profit of that. So then they're changing their ship, their fishery zones. They end up encroaching upon other people's territory and that gets into various conflicts. So those are some examples. Um, I don't know if you have anything else you want to add to that? Uh, but. I, would just, I would just add from kind of a research standpoint. Yeah. Um, we're also, you know, there is a race to do research in the Arctic as well. And at the moment, we are not poised to, to win that race. We have one icebreaker. China has, I think, 20, and Russia has 25. <laughs> so we you know, we need to invest more in Arctic research if we want to be part of this kind of global opening and understanding of changes in the Arctic. Yeah, and infrastructure in general in the Arctic is, is a definite lack. Um, so that means, you know, whether it's an oil spill like the Exxon Valdez or whether it's deep sea mining disaster that happens, there isn't the infrastructure to actually clean up anything. So you don't have ports, you don't have accessible areas, the water temperature and the, velocity, the viscosity of the water is very different. So you're, you, a lot of times you're using the heavy fuel oil, which is a lot harder to clean up. And so if you have an issue in one place, it, it spreads and it sort of is a joint responsibility to, to clean up or to make different things happen. So yeah, infrastructure and in that we're, yeah. A joint challenge, or not necessarily all working together. Yeah. Is this anything on Zoom? Any other 
questions? All right. And nothing online? No. So, no. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So thank you both very much. This was super informative and very fun and a little scary too. Uh, but now that we have this knowledge, hopefully we can do something to make things a little less bad. Yeah, I wanted everyone to thank. I want to thank everyone who showed up here, everyone who's on Zoom, and also to remind everyone there will be another sustainability lecture in May. Uh, date to be determined yet. But if anyone is not on our mailing list and wants to be added to, there is a piece of paper there where you can add your name and email. We can add you to the list so you can get notices for future lectures. So this year we have two more, one in May, one in June. And then for next year, we usually start up again in November. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. And yes, there's a question. Yes, and this lecture will be, is being recorded and it will be posted on our channel, on the cable channel for the town, cable, uh, channel three. And also it will be on YouTube under Freeport Sustainability. So, uh, yes, the one in May will be food waste and composting. And the one in June is sustainable seafood and sustainable farming for seafood. All right. Well, thank you everyone, have a great evening. Bye.